Hi, my name's Lizzie. I'm one of the registrar doctors in histopathology. Just to start, let me explain that histopathology actually means the study of diseases in tissues, and that's exactly what we're going to have a look at. So I have a few made up case histories just to illustrate the range of specimens that we receive within the laboratory. Case one is a 23 year old man who's got a long history of on and off abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea and constipation. He has some investigations, including an OGD. This is a camera procedure which looks in the esophagus through the stomach and to the duodenum. Some biopsies of the duodenum are taken. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine and from here it goes into the duodenum and ileum. In order to know what abnormal tissue looks like, first we need to know what the normal tissue looks like and here we have a picture of a normal duodenal biopsy. Looking at this on higher power, we can see that the duodenum has these long villi which are finger-like projections which extend into the lumen of the duodenum increasing the surface area and improving absorption of nutrients from the material passing through it has these short crypts at the bottom and then in the epithelium there are these small blue dots which are lymphocytes a type of white blood cell and within the lamina propria, the underlying tissue, there are more lymphocytes and occasional inflammatory cells. Now these are a normal feature, but there shouldn't be too many of them. So this is a picture of the patient's duodenal biopsy. And at lower power, we can see that it is not normal. Uh, the tissue is much busier, i.e. more cells present than the normal tissue. And then if we look at this on higher power, one of the most striking features is we've lost those long villi. They've been reduced to these little stumps here. This is called villus blunting or villus atrophy. Also, we can see there are a lot more of the blue dots present in the epithelium, so a lot more lymphocytes present. And within the lamina propria, the underlying tissue, there are a lot more inflammatory cells present. So the conclusion for case one is that we have got inflammation and damage of the duodenum. Now this could be caused by many things, but this particular pattern of damage is suggestive of a disease called celiac disease. This is an autoimmune disease which is driven by the presence of gluten in the diet. However, diagnosing celiac disease requires all the different tests to fit together. And so this patient would require a histology plus a positive antibody test plus the correct clinical history to say that they have celiac disease. So for our part, we would generate a report describing the findings that we see and explaining the significance. We would comment on the additional tests needed if they hadn't already been performed. The next case is an 8 year old man with a new skin coloured lesion growing on his face. This lesion is round and slightly raised. It's painless and it has a central scab. The lesion is growing slowly but it is getting bigger. So this man has had an excision of the lesion and here we have a picture of it at low power. So this is a section of skin and on the left hand side we've got the normal skin with hair follicles present and on the right hand side we've got our lesion. Now this would be described as nodules of basaloid cells. These are dark in colour. It's quite well circumscribed. I can draw a line around it quite nicely. And there is an area of central ulceration which would was what he would have seen as the scab. So looking at higher power, we've got tightly packed areas of these basaloid cells, i.e dark colour cells and these show an interesting feature where the cells at the edges of the nodules line up in a feature we call peripheral palisading. This picture also shows that this surrounding tissue has quite a fuzzy bluish appearance. This is something we call solar elastosis and this is indicative of long-term sun exposure. So this case is one of a basal cell carcinoma or a BCC. This is the most common type of skin cancer and it is associated with long term sun exposure. It will continue to grow and damage the tissues around it, but it is very unlikely to spread to other parts of the body. 
So we would generate a report stating the diagnosis and we would also comment on if the lesion has been completely excised because if not, there is a chance that it would recur. So case three is that of a 45 year old man who develops a new firm lump on the side of his face, roughly at the level of the angle of the jaw. The lump is painless and of note is that he is a current smoker. So he has an ultrasound scan which confirms the growth and it's situated within the parotid gland. The parotid gland is one of the salivary glands situated around the mouth. So he undergoes an operation to remove this. So here we have a section of the parotid gland and the tumour at lower power. And we can see that we have normal parotid tissue on the right hand side here and the tumour is on the left. This picture also demonstrates that we ink the surface of surgical specimens in order to demonstrate where the margin is. So looking at this tumour on higher power, it has really quite an unusual appearance. It's made up of this double layer of epithelial cells, which are these light coloured ones here, and these are arranged in complex folds. The stroma, the underlying tissue of the tumour, has areas of dense lymphocytes, these blue dots that we've seen before, and it also has these cystic spaces. So case three is an example of a Warthin's tumour. This is a tumour of the salivary glands and almost always occurs in the parotid. They can be bilateral and they are associated with smoking. They are a benign tumour, i.e. they do not spread elsewhere, but they do have the potential to turn into a malignant tumour which could spread elsewhere. So we would generate a report stating the diagnosis and commenting on if the tumour is completely excised. Case 4 is a 70 year old woman who notices a change in bowel habit so she goes for her, to her GP and is referred for a colonoscopy. Now this is another camera test which looks at the large bowel this time. At the colonoscopy a polyp is seen within the descending colon. This polyp is removed which pinched off from the bowel lining and sent for examination. So this is a picture of the polyp at low power and we can see normal bowel lining on this side and then as we come around here we've got this mushrooming like growth of tissue on the right hand side. So looking at higher power we've got a picture of the normal bowel mucosa here and then a picture of the polyp here. As you can see, within the polyp, the epithelial cells have bigger, darker nuclei and the architecture of the glands is much more disorganised. Within the normal bowel mucosa, they should be quite straight and regular. So these are features of dysplasia, i.e. the epithelium is not developing properly. So this patient has a tubular adenoma with low-grade dysplasia. A tubular adenoma is a polyp, a benign tumour of the bowel lining, but it can progress to cancer. They all show dysplasia and this may be low or high grade. If it's high grade, there is an increased risk of progression to cancer. So we would generate a report stating the diagnosis and commenting on if the polyp had been completely removed. So case five is a 55 year old man who notices a change in bowel habit again. He has a colonoscopy and biopsies are taken from the transverse colon. So this is a picture of the biopsy at low power and we can see that in the top half of the biopsy we've got a relatively normal appearance with glands that are quite uniform and light in colour and then at the bottom of this biopsy we've got glands that have an abnormal appearance. At higher power we can see that these abnormal glands have larger darker nuclei and the architecture is irregular. These glands can be seen to be infiltrating into the tissue surrounding them, the lamina propria, and we've got an inflammatory cell response to that. So unfortunately, this is an example of a patient who has colonic adenocarcinoma. The adeno part means gland forming cancer because it develops from the cells that normally form the glands of the bowel. So we would 
generate a report and the patient will be sent for further investigations and treatment. So lastly, I would just like to say that not all of histopathology is pink and blue. There are a number of other types of tests that we use when formulating diagnoses, and these come in a range of colours. There is immunohistochemistry. This works by detecting targeted proteins within a tissue to answer a certain question we might have. There are special stains, and these can be used to highlight certain properties of a tissue or to highlight microorganisms seen within that tissue. There is electron microscopy, and you can see the separate video for this. And there are molecular techniques such as PCR or FISH. These are used to look at particular genetic abnormalities and are becoming increasingly important in assessing if a tumour will respond to a certain type of medication. These are known as targeted therapies. That's all. Thanks very much for watching.